This week might be the last, unless people like you can help us keep this show going. Go to patreon.com slash act out to become a patron of act out and keep us acting out on the front lines. This week, a wall is a wall until it's the sky. Ana Teresa Fernandez shows us how we might view things differently, simply through the application of color. Next up, I'm not one to celebrate a corporatized holiday, but this Mother's Day, leave the chocolates behind and stand up for peace. And finally, you ever wonder where the idea for our militarized police came from? Trial, error, and a determined piece of low-life scum. But first, poetry can. Poetry can make amends, make benign friends of wicked men, give times a rosy sheen of peace when war's too real a scene. And so reversed, these heavy lines of verse can shine a light, pry through closed off spaces, find the horror that the horrid would much rather hide. No sweetened anecdote, no sugar coat, no, in these lines are daggers made to pierce dull minds, illuminate dark eyes, and do so with a poison. Seductive so, that it's so productive so, emotions roll, a glimmer flickers in the soul, and so, a color sweep, a music note, a poem's piece, a video, creative claws that at closed minds do always gnaw, asking why, pushing, pulling, so that is what they sold, this is what you're told, but here, listen, watch. Take it in and dirty their brainwash. Let it soak your every synapse. Let your walls collapse. Erase the lines that dictate how you must see this world your life. Read the lines. Between them sit and dine. Pull forth the appetite, the lust for knowledge, not this bondage. Be free inside your mind. There is no change that is not born from comfort so forlorn, from apathy that's torn. We can scream and yell and hate, and yet still we may. I've seen such days. But here are lines that do not seek to shriek, the images that are conjured. I'm not here to preach. I'm here to ask. Don't let this pass without the questions I do mention. Why do you think the way you do? Who made your mold that you do hold, and is it corporate-owned? Who do you hate and why? Whose life did you decide is worth less than those of these who sit right by your side? Who, what keeps you still and quiet? What keeps you so dutifully in line? What keeps you kept inside? Why do you sneer at picket lines? Why do you scoff at those who die for sake of planet people, not for flag, state, or steeple? And here you might just shut this off, click to comment, hey you, fuck off. I've seen it, and if you feel you must, repeat it. Can't save them all. And if you rather fall, devolve into Neanderthal like drivel, let me simply swivel to address the ones that might not be so easily entrenched in muck and mire a sad and sick empire to you. The ones who sometimes think to question, the ones who feel that this is wrong but have not yet moved to mention, to you this verse, this poem goes. From here on out, more so prose, but same will be the goal. Question all and never stand, so glued to what you know, that fact can't prove you wrong and move you forward. Walk or crawl, these words are on your side in more colors that are vibrant. In the light that battles tyrants, art is in our fight, a riot in the heart. The painted songs, the vivid lines, the bursts of hues that in our souls imbue art, love, and justice. Poetry can make amends, but in this time now let us tend to fire yours and mine with stroking lines flicker, rise. Welcome to Act Out. I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your tipping point. Art. From poetry to theater to painting, sculptures, all that that spoken word wrapped up in a verse is what today's interview embodies. The power of art to flip your vision, to question how you question, if you do question. To take, some, to, to take something that you've accepted as one thing and make it something else, peppered with socio-political meaning and then some. Ana Teresa Fernandez is an artist who works in a variety of mediums, from ice sculpture shoes to performance art util utilizing a white stallion and a sinkhole. 
Her work has caused more than a little controversy, from anti-immigration fanatics in Arizona, as well as nuns in Spain and a lot in between. Focusing on immigration and women's issues, she pours her own story as both an immigrant and a woman into all of her pieces, pushing the viewer once again to question, not just themselves, but the system that they live in. Take a look. You have a formidable collection of what you call social sculpture. Uh, let's start with the, the latest one that I saw, Baranda La Frontera, which is erasing the border. Um, it started as a painting, if I understand correctly, and then turned into a 3D installation. Talk about this work, your inspiration, and why and how you did it. Well, it actually started as a performance and intervention in 2011. And then it became a painting. And then it became a community um, engagement process. And then it became a triptych where it was done in three locations. So it's the first time I, I did it was in 2011 in Tijuana, um, which was the border that I actually had to cross when I was moving to the States when I was 10 years old. Um, and it uh, at the time, you know, uh, there were so many stories of people being deported, people that have existed and lived in the States for over 20 years and families being divided and the, all these structures that, you know, um, were being held in place all of a sudden became ruptured. And I think, um, you know, sadly to say during Barack Obama's presidency, it's the most amount of deportations ever in history. And um, so there's a huge amount of um, frustration and anger that you feel around that area it's not just only people risking their lives to cross the border but it's like people that already belong belonged here in the states being sent back um and i think it was this frustration that led me to want to do this intervention in 2011 which was to just create an illusion of of what if there was a, a morsel that was missing what if there was a hole in the wall and using kind of what I have as a weapon, which is paint. Um, I'm an artist and I'm a painter. And so I thought I could use that as a, as a way of expressing my ideology of what I want to see in place. Something I found interesting looking through your work um, is the descriptions that you write. And I'll get to some of the other ones in a second. But in the, this description, you use a quote, if a color cannot cure, can it at least incite hope? Talk about the, this power of art, even something as simple as a color, which you, you used blue. Color can be so powerful. You know, it just provokes the imagination in a different way where there's no text, there's no explanation, there's no essay. It's just like a block of color placed in front of the wall that gives the sensation of sky and then the obfuscation um, of the wall blending into the sky. And I think... It, it, it triggers the imagination in a different way, in a way that text can't trigger it, you know? And I'm also curious, it's sort of in the same the same idea of, of painting onto a wall and having it mean something else, the, uh, <clears throat> the piece you did, The Pillars of Strength. Um, and it speaks so well to this idea of opportunistic art. You know, you, you walk into a place and you're not supposed to necessarily use that. I mean, obviously the border wall isn't meant to be, you know, a canvas, um, but then you, you create a canvas out of it by saying, you know, okay, well, what if we look at it this way? Um, talk a little bit about like how you go about, you know, using this sort of opportunistic style of, of, uh, of painting in whether that be the pillars of strength or like the border wall. I think spaces and objects have thrust, you know, and it can, and, and, and not just like in the scientific term, but, in the, but I feel like, um, ingenuity it's 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 like a, a type of visual vocabulary of of seeing the opportunity in in an object beyond its like invention and the pillars of strength when i was invited to do a, a residency there and um that space is a combination half of it is a convent and the other half is an artist's residency for <laughs> artists which i think we pray in different ways but <laughs> Um, <laughs> I thought that that was such an incredible like mathematical equation. And there was a section where the roof was sagging because this building was built in 1495. And they, they didn't allow us to go underneath it because the roof was about to like collapse or something. And I was like, oh, well, what if I do a performance where I draw these women? There are like caryatids, you know, like Greek caryatids holding up the space. And the ironic thing was that the nuns were just like, they saw it and they were like, oh, 
you we don't want women with exposed arms and legs holding up the walls of our church and like where we come and pray and it was erased like it was they they asked for it to be removed and the art center got in a huge trouble because of it and um it's been one of the you know three four times that my my work has been um censored but um but it was it was because it was a type of woman that they didn't you know want holding the 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 church walls up. Your work is so rich in allegory, and so it's clear that you're incredibly well read and you're incredibly in intellectual. You use everything from Plato's Cave to poems to writers to activists um, that inspire your work. So I'm I'm kind of curious how do you how do you find these pieces, and uh, you also said that you're very politically active. How do you weave politics into that at the same time and is it is it important to you like as a feminist and also as an immigrant because there's this horrible uh stereotype that immigrants are idiots and they don't they're not well read and you know they're just here to steal our jobs um so how do you like do you feel that it's important to weave this intellectual aspect as a woman and as an immigrant as well as the the political side of things yeah, I mean, I have a little joke, but um, people are always like, oh, you're from Mexico? Your English is so good. And I'm like, <laughs> well, you should hear my French and my Portuguese and my Italian. They're pretty good, too. You know, I'm like, <laughs> um, it's, it's, I think it's, it's, it's so incredibly telling uh, of how people's perspectives, how narrow they, they are in terms of, like, what their outlook is as of like on a Mexican or on a Salvadorian or on a, you know, immigrant, whatever, whatever label um, country you want to give it. But I think, you know, I, I, I was incredibly um, privileged in the sense that I grew up in a very, very like creative and intellectual family that that, that was kind of like the priorities, you know, um, they were heavily focused on just kind of consuming information and not, not just information in terms of like what's information today, kind of the, the ideology of information, but like consuming information via literature, via experience, visual experience, you know, writers, artists, thinkers. As I got older, you know, like you, you just start um, kind of informing your imagination in a different way, you know, and, and being able to see different just different ways of experiencing the world, you know, through, through words and, and through images. And so you start picking up on moments that are magical within the everyday, you know, and you start kind of having a more microscopic look um, as to what the possibility is, you know, and, and just being enchanted with, with different little things that you just, so many people just kind of go by or drive by or walk past. And, um, and I think that's, definitely heavily due to my to my parents you know and kind of them instigating you know having for us to have like a creative curiosity so finally i wanted to i wanted to ask you because you have you have you have paintings which i assume are hung in galleries and i saw that you have connections with galleries and then of course you have these pieces that are you know the opposite they are basically street art or wall art or what have you um what is the importance to you of creating these pieces that are out there so that anybody, whether they have access to galleries or not, can see them. Oh, it's it's immense for me. Like I think, um, I I think it's it's kind of very reflective of how I am. I tend to like be very extroverted and then very introverted, and to like just have a moment, create a situation or a moment where people are outside, they're going about their daily business, and they they're met with something that just either ignites or illuminates something different, you know, where it just kind of transcends that moment and they're asked to investigate something about within themselves to create a, a like parentheses or rupture kind of the everyday and create this magical moment of just um, self, self um, questioning, like in the, in a good way. Of course, you have that with either the wall as as well. Like, what? How? Why do you see the wall this way, and and why do you see it as? Do you see it as a good thing, a bad thing? Yeah, and why is it so? I mean, uh, to me, it was so incredible to to witness like the amount of hate that came out of you know me painting the wall, and I'm like, why is it so threatening that I just placed paint on a wall? Like, how did it infuriate people so heavily? Like why like why are people so afraid of the imagination like 
why are they so resistant to want to see it different to see it differently you know for more information on Ana Teresa and her work, visit AnnaTeresaFernandez.com. Now, moving on, let's take a look at a special way to celebrate Mother's Day this weekend. Now, I'm really not one for corporatized holidays like Valentine's Day or Mother's Day. That being said, love you, Mama. But honestly, what is the point of buying them a cheap plastic nothing made by a kid whose own mom never gets to see him because they both work 20-hour days? Or flowers that have been shipped around the world only to land and start to smell funny in the corner of your room? I admit I have a less robust argument if you buy them a lovely local plant from, say, a farmer's market that can sit in the window, grow and bring joy to many with the occasional bloom or even perhaps a fruit or vegetable of some kind. All of that aside, I think the strongest way to show your support for your mom is to come together in the name of peace. Julia Ward Howe, abolitionist, social activist, poet, and the author of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. It's a little too much God and jingoism in that one for me, but nonetheless, as an anti-war activist, she responded to the bloodshed in both the American Civil War and the Franco-Prussian War by penning the Mother's Day Proclamation. The Mother's Day Proclamation is an open letter of sorts to women around the world, calling on them to unite for peace and take a more active role in shaping the foreign policy of their governments. In the proclamation, she writes, Arise, all women who have hearts. Whether your baptism be that of water or of tears, say firmly, we will not have great questions decided by irrelevant agencies. Our husbands shall not come to us, reeking with carnage for caresses and applause. Our sons shall not be taken from us to unlearn all that we have been able to teach them of charity, mercy, and patience. We, women of one country, will be too tender of those of another country to allow our sons to be trained to injure theirs. From the bosom of the devastated earth, a voice goes up with our own. It says, disarm, disarm. The sword of murder is not the balance of justice. Blood does not wipe out dishonor, nor violence vindicate possession. As men have often forsaken the plow and the anvil at the summons of war, let women now leave all that may be left of home for a great and earnest day of counsel. I'm not religious, but let me just say, amen, Julia, a fucking men. Now, fast forward some hundred odd years or so, and this message rings powerfully against the din of drones and endless warfare. And this weekend, it is this message of women's power and military disarmament that will once again be voiced at Code Pink's Mother's Day Peace Festival. This coming Saturday the 7th, speakers, performers, and activists will come together outside of the White House to, as Code Pink puts it, reject violence around the world and build local peace economies. If you can't make it to DC, hell, create your own Mother's Day Peace shindig. If you're a mom, I know that you know other moms. And what better weekend to start some community building around peace and justice? And also show your support for moms and peace and for moms for peace around the world using these hashtags, moms for peace and disarm for moms. And for more info on Code Pink and their work fighting the military industrial complex, visit codepink.org. Now, moving on, it's been a while since we called out a lowlife scum and we know there's no sort shortage. So here is this week's award recipient. You lowlife scum. John Timoney and the Miami Model. Now that sounds pretty benign, like the name of a cross-cultural Irish crime drama complete with a stereotypically sexy woman wearing a thong bikini. But no, it is far more sinister than that. John Timoney has an interesting history. Born in Dublin, he moved to New York when he was 13 and eventually became a police officer with the NYPD, where he did quite well. In 1988, as deputy commissioner, he helped to lead the police response to the Tompkins Square Pro Park protests, which ended in more than 100 official complaints of police violence. Not just to protesters, mind you, but to innocent bystanders and press as well. 
Thus began a lucrative career marked by his quote-unquote ability to deal with large crowds of protesters. In 1998, he moved to the Philadelphia Police Department to work as police commissioner, presiding over the police tactics and actions in the 2000 Republican National Convention that witnessed the now well-known tactic of infiltrating and spying on activist groups, raiding workshop space, and detaining activists who were making signs and puppets for more than two hours with no warrant, and of course, the violent arrest of more than 400 people. Timney then made a brief foray into the private sector, like you do, before heading down to Miami for a cool $8 million in order to outline police tactics for the upcoming free trade area, free trade area of the Americas Summit in 2003. What followed has been dubbed the start of paramilitary policing in the U.S., and as one writer from the St. Petersburg Times wrote, the show of force would have made a Latin American dictator blush. Journalist and filmmaker Jeremy Scahill was also there as a reporter with Democracy Now! and describes the scene like this. The forces fired indiscriminately into crowds of unarmed protesters. Scores of people were hit with skin-piercing rubber bullets. Thousands were gassed with an array of chemicals. On several occasions, police fired loud concussion grenades into the crowds. Police shocked people with electric tasers. Demonstrators were shot in the back as they retreated. One young guy's apparent crime was holding his fingers in a peace sign in front of the troops. And they shot him multiple times, including once in the stomach at point-blank range. It was clear from the jump that Timoney's men came prepared to crack heads, and they did that over and over. Scahill goes on to describe how his colleague, Anna Noguera, who was wearing press credentials in plain sight, was not only violently arrested, but forced to strip in jail in front of male officers and held in jail until 3.30 in the morning, only after Scahill posted her $500 bail, even after continued calls from both Democracy Now! and the ACLU. Finally, in Scahill's report, a chilling and telling sign of things to come. Miami Mayor Manny Diaz called the police actions last week a model for homeland security. FTAA officials called it extraordinary. Several cities sent law enforcement observers to the protests to study what some are now referring to as the Miami model. And if you were ever part of an Occupy encampment, you might recognize these tactics, whether that be the embedding and inciting violence or just plain and simple violence, charging peaceful protesters, beating them, unlawful search and seizure, unlawful arrest, detainment, so on and so forth. Or if you happen to hear about Bahrain, Yes, Bahrain. Part of the Arab Spring uprising in 2011, where pro-democracy activists rose up against not only their own corrupt government, but the support forces brought in from both Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, who worried that any successful uprising in Bahrain would spread. In response to their demands for justice and equality, protesters were met with everything from tear gas to torture as they assembled around Pearl Square in the capital, Manama. Ali Alderi, a Bahraini journalist and activist who was there at the time, describes the scene of a beautiful uprising. Sunni and Shia praying together, activists putting roses in the barrels of military guns, sliced by the extreme violence of security forces. Human rights groups reported multiple deaths due to the use of tear gas alone. American made, by the way, one of old Timoney's favorite tools in his less than lethal arsenal. Don't let people tell you that our manufacturing sector is dead. So, this is all horrible, but why am I bringing it up? So this jackass went to Bahrain and took his methods with him. It's not like we're new to the idea of barging into countries, killing random people, and calling it consulting or democracy. So why bring up John Timoney in the Miami model today? Well, aside from the fact that our police forces have militarized faster than a right-winger confronted with facts, it is important to know that these tactics are homegrown. This increase in the use of so-called less-than-lethal weapons like tear gas, rubber bullets, and sound cannons, and an, an ever-growing rift between police brutality and systemic accountability are homemade. They're not some Middle East, South American, or Asian problem that somehow found its way into the cozy confines of our democracy. That shit was made here and exported. Like Naomi Klein outlines in her book, The Shock Doctrine, 
We've been trying these shock, awe, and payout schemes around the world since the 1950s. And after 9-11, the climate was just, just about right to bring them home. And just like with 9-11, the publicized reasons always tout national security, freedom, and our way of life. Timoney has on many occasions argued that his tax tactics simply rest on the tenets of things like keeping the streets clear so that people aren't interrupted and inconvenienced by those pesky protesters. Although, isn't it funny how a, an all-out riot tends to block more traffic than a peaceful protest? Yeah, I call bullshit, and so does the rest of the 99%. And that is why I bring this up, so that we not only understand our country's role in global terror, but understand that we, the 99%, are fighting around the world. And just as lowlife scum like Timoney seek to spread their psychopathic schemes anywhere and everywhere that'll take them, we have to do the same. Fight here, in your streets, in your towns, but connect with those fighting all over the world because for fuck's sake, we are all fighting the same damn evil, the same lowlife scum. And tactics like this Miami model will not be overturned unless we overturn them. That shock doctrine has banked the oligarchs billions and they're not gonna let go of it just because we took the time to make a protest sign. Find inspiration and willpower in the stories of those who stood up and keep standing up. Find power in your powerlessness, as Vaclav Havel writes. Fight fascists because they are fascist, not because you think you'll win, as Hedges writes. And for those fellow existentialists out there, mooch some motivation from Ali Alderi's remembering Pearl Square. For that brief period, we had lived beyond sectarianism. The square was a different way of life. It made you feel, as Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish once said, that there was something worth living for on this earth. I cannot see any meaning beyond the life fashioned by the Arab in his springtime, the life that has turned so many cities in the Arab world into squares of liberation. This is a time that we will always be proud we were a part of. Five years later, Bahrain is still fighting for life beyond sectarianism because they know, as so many of us know, that those moments only exist in the ongoing fight against corruption, greed, war, and hate against lowlife scum worldwide. You lowlife scum. Hopefully that shot of resistance, that dose of dissent, will get some asses in gear. To read more of Ali Alderi's accounts on Bahrain's uprising, and indeed seven others, check out Diaries of an Unfinished Revolution. Key word there being unfinished. Ask yourself what it would take for you to give of yourself, time, energy, to fight for something better, as opposed to living in a system made for dying. And if you already are, well, fucking A, let's keep going. Thank you everyone for watching, and please do spread and share this with all of your friends, foes, and people you don't know. Check out the last slide to see all of the sites that I mentioned in the show, and be sure to follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and subscribe on YouTube. From the Devil's Den, Good night, and act out. And real quick, to keep independent, non-corporatized media like this show going, donate at Occupy.com donate. If you'd like to donate directly to Act Out, visit Patreon.com actout.